This is the first recording for your We the People project. This recording will go over question number one. I am to Moodle at this point, so if you need some time, pause the recording and go ahead and get yourselves to Moodle and get logged in and get into our government class. Once you're there, click play and we'll continue working. Once you get to Moodle, if you scroll down and go to Unit 3, the Constitution, click on We the People Documents. And when you click on We the People Documents, you'll click on the December hearing question and that will download that document and on my Mac I'll click that and it'll pop up so now now we're here to the question this is question number one the doctrine of separation of powers was adopted by the convention of 1787 not to promote efficiency but to preclude the exercise of arbitrary power the purpose was not to avoid friction but to save the people from autocracy how would you explain the doctrine of separation of powers and what are its major features? Why did the framers believe that mere separation of powers was not enough? Why did they think the different branches would also need checks on one another? What provisions of the Constitution enable one branch to check and balance the power of another? In Federalist number 48, Publius writes that power has an encroaching nature and it should be effectually restrained. After theoretically dividing the classes of power into legislative, executive, or judiciary, the next and most difficult task is to provide some practical security for each against the invasion of the others. Do you agree or disagree? Why? What evidence, historical or contemporary, can you cite to fortify your answer? Let's start breaking down this question into its main components. What I've provided on this document are important texts that you should become familiar with and in all likelihood use some citations from when you're answering your question. I've also given you some key terms and on the right side the comments uh, are the definitions for those key terms. And then I've also given you just a brief two or three bullet points on what you really really need to do to answer this question really well. Let's start by breaking down what the question asks for and see if we can give you guys some background on this question. So we're talking about separation of powers. That's the main topic of this question. Separation of powers is the idea that government should not be rested in a single person or a single body of government. It should be, as separation of powers makes it sound, separated into different bodies of government. In the United States, those bodies of government are called the branches of government, and there are three of them, executive, legislative, and judicial. Most of you are familiar with these three branches of government, but we may not be very familiar with what exactly each one does or then how they check and balance each other. The question here is talking about saving people from autocracy, and that means that the founders of our Constitution and of our country were afraid of returning to a system like the British government had where the Parliament was the main body of government that was in charge. Remember at this time the monarchy or the king and queen was there but they weren't the most powerful political body. The Parliament was the most powerful body but there wasn't very much check on the Parliament. The Parliament could do a mostly whatever it wanted to do. So, when we're looking at separation of powers, we need to try to figure out why the founders wanted to separate powers into different sections of government. It says that it was not to avoid friction, which is a really important point. The legislative branch and the executive branch, for example, have a lot of friction. They have a lot of disagreements. You see that in the news all the time, uh, especially with the modern uh, Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. There is tons of friction, tons of disagreement between President Obama and the House of Representatives and the Senate, which is the legislative branch. But the argument here is that separation of powers does not want to avoid that friction, but it wants to keep the government from becoming too intrusive into our lives and too powerful. The next part of the question, looking here at the first bullet point, wonders why the framers believed that separation of powers wasn't good enough, why they need to have checks and balances. There are some good charts to look at here for checks and balances. If you uh, look them up on the internet, just type in checks and balances and you'll see great examples of each branch of government checking the other branch uh, 
And you need to try to answer that question, why the framers thought that checks were needed. If the executive branch enforces the laws that, that the legislative branch creates, why is it important that the judicial branch, the courts, be able to tell the president and the Congress that their actions are unconstitutional? What you'll find is that in cases like Marbury versus Madison in 1803, the courts created something called judicial review where the courts could tell the executive and the legislative branch that the laws that they had created went against the Constitution. And what this does is it establishes the Constitution as the most important guiding document of our country. Not a single president, not an elected representative, not a body of representatives like the House or the Senate, but a document. And that document, no law can go against that document. No law can go against the Constitution. So checks and balances make sure that each of the three branches are always being guided by that document and not being guided by whatever they want to do. This question also refers to uh, Plubius and Federalist number 48. So if you click on this, we can read Federalist number 48, and I'll leave this to you to read through. Um, and as it's popping up here, Federalist number... Ooh, are we going to pop up? Let's see if we can get it. There we go. Now it's going to pop up. This gives you a summary of uh, the Federalist Paper, and this gives us a really good argument for why state governments and national governments have checks on each other, and why representation in the national government is going to be something that keeps the national government from becoming too powerful. There was a lot of fear in the early colonies that this new government that this new government would become far too powerful for any of the people to look at. So, we'll uh, you'll read through this on your own and gather some information there. You also have articles 1, 2, and 3 of the Constitution and then the case brief for Myers versus the United States, which as you can see right here is the court case that the question references in the first part of the question. Key terms here, separation of powers, preclude arbitrary autocracy, doctrine, branches of government, checks and balances, court brief, Supreme Court judicial review, contemporary ev evidence, and fortify all those definitions are on the side. Uh, and if you have any other troubles with that, just Google those and you'll find some good information. We'll finish with this. The three big things that you need to make sure to do if you're going to have a good answer you need to first summarize and explain what separation of powers is. You need to show the judges that you understand this term, where it comes from, and why it's important in the United States, both at the time of our founding and today. The second thing you need to do is to connect separation of powers to checks and balances. How does checks and balances keep separation of powers working correctly? So find good examples of checks and balances and use those to prove your point that checks and balances keep separation of powers working correctly. And then lastly, you need to have an opinion. You need to take a stand. Does power really encroach once unless it is restrained? Which means does power tend to increase? Do people in power tend to take more power unless there are systems that keep that power from increasing? See if you can find examples from today of government or government officials taking more power unless some law or some group makes sure that that power doesn't increase itself. Good luck. If you have any questions, as always, you are free to ask me.